Today, I am talking with Brett Wooden. Welcome, Brett. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Brett, you know, I know a fair amount about you, but I want our audience to get a good sense of who Brett Wooden is. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been up to recently? Yeah, so I'm Brett Wooden. I'm the SVP of innovation at TSI. And lately, really just been into app development. So immersing some of our credit union clients and bank clients within app development, developing certain specific softwares, and just, you know, really educating on the design thinking process, what, what it is to build an app and why, why is the importance. And it's exciting times right now because there is a lot of challenges happening in the financial space. And so looking at different ways to draw in additional income, gain, you know, new member experiences. So really that's what I've been up to is just kind of education, app development, and then occasionally just a few Lego builds personally. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Brett is a big Lego builder and an impressive Lego builder. And I'm excited about this because we have kind of worked together on an app project. And that's where I realized how much you know about this space and how committed to it you are. And I love that you're talking about that why, because we always talk about the why here when we're talking about yeah. allowance and money smart kids. But you very much focus on the why of anything that you're producing. And so this is going to be, I have to just give this disclaimer. We're going to start in a different place than I normally do in the Art of Allowance podcast. Although for a kid whose favorite movies were Blade Runner and Star Wars, jumping into the realm of tech and the metaverse, it's very comfortable and exciting for me. So let's jump in right here. The term metaverse was first coined by the sci-fi writer Neil Stevenson in his book, Snow Crash. I believe that was 1992. But what does the metaverse mean to us now? So this is why I brought Brett on to talk a little bit about this and what it means to us and how it can might affect our kids and, and money. We're going to even get to get to that. But this recent Wired article I saw gave us a few scenarios. So is the metaverse, metaverse like user-generated games in Roblox? Is the metaverse virtual real estate in Decentraland? Or is it just like Facebook 3.0? Isn't this just another term for cyberspace? Anyway. Very confusing. Can you define, Brett, what the metaverse means to us today? I would say today, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've read multiple books, very similar to, you know, you articles about it. And I would say my depiction of the metaverse is kind of we're moving into Web 3. Um, so Web 2 is really where, you know, you, you have like your Insta where we're pushing the content, but still someone owns that content where I feel like Web3, the metaverse, we're living in it now. So you look at with the pandemic, Teams is a form of the metaverse. We're changing our backgrounds, using web filters. And you look at starting to live in an environment where we're not face-to-face. -face. So utilizing virtual reality. You even look at, you mentioned games like Roadblox, where kids now are doing play dates where they're playing a game and then they're on FaceTime or on Zoom talking with each other while they're playing the game. You also look at the tech companies are really pushing out on Netflix and Apple, their Apple TV, they're pushing out where you can do joint watching of movies where you're vi on video while you're watching your favorite TV show or movie and you're not having to be in the same room. And so really it's it's kind of a virtual meetup space. A lot of people, when they think of the metaverse, they think of like, oh, Oculus or, you know, some form of VR set where you're immersing yourself. That is a form of the metaverse, but I think we're gradually moving into it through kind of these little interactions like today through podcast, you know, video cast through teams, as well as, you know, playing games and creating avatars. Those type of things can be a form of the metaverse. And I think they're kind of that gradual stepping stone to immersing ourselves within the virtual reality world. Yeah. Yeah, because I tend to, when I think of the metaverse, I think of that, that VR world. I think that might be what a lot of people think of. But then when I think of Web 3.0, I immediately think of like crypto, right? I mean, not just crypto money, but also just smart contracts and the like. So... What should we be excited about when it comes to the metaverse? Like, for, for example, like the joint watching. I think that's interesting. I haven't tried it. I don't know if you've tried it. I'm that doesn't like I'm hoping that the metaverse is going to be transcendent in some way. 
And where do you hope that the, tr that the metaverse might be transcended? Because I think in the 3D virtual worlds, we've all seen, well, maybe not all of us have seen or read, say, Ready Player One or something like that, where it's full immersion. And, and I'm not saying that that's even you know, remotely possible. From what I've read, it's probably not the kind of thing that we're really kind of headed towards. And if we are, it's a long way off. But like, kind of, I guess it's really separating the hype from the reality and what should we be excited about? You know, should we be skeptical of it because you have a huge company like Facebook that just rebrands themselves as meta or should we really be excited about it? And, and for what reasons should we be excited about it? I think, the, you know, the first reason to be excited about it is, is the technology that will align with it. And I think we're starting to see that too. You, you know, you made the point about, you know, smart contracts, blockchain, really our digital assets. I think the thing that excites me is that right now, you know, you go on Instagram, Meta, Facebook, those companies own our stuff. So if I post information, if I post photos, they own that. But as we move into this Web3 and Metaverse, we become the owner. We'll be on blockchains. Mm. There'll be smart, you know, contracts. We'll have NFTs with all of our digital assets. I think you look at even, you know, from a kid perspective, the amount of money as, as adults that we spend on our kids' games. Uh, so like block, you know, roadblocks, Minecraft, if those games were to go under, all of that money we spent on digital assets for our kids is gone. Where in this new environment, yeah. it's really you can move things and sell things in these environments. So, you know, Grand Theft Auto would be another game where if you buy a Chrome Ferrari in that game and it's only a one-time thing and it never is again, then the kids can learn to sell it in those games. And, you know, again, digital assets will just be kind of a new way in which we move to different environments. We can sell digital assets. We can own digital assets. Because right now it's kind of like a hodgepodge world of, you know, like Instagram owns our photos, the games own ours, but we can sometimes sell them, you know, so that's exciting to me. The other is artificial intelligence. I love the phase that we're in right now because you've got this future shock happening. You've got, you know, chat GPT, you've got, you know, all these others, Google coming out with theirs and schools and businesses have no idea what to do. Government doesn't know what to do. So they're all trying to get ahead of it. And so the mm -hmm. form of future shock is when you have tech moving faster than policies, procedures, government. And so you're seeing that happen right now where my daughter's school just sent out an email saying, if you get caught using Chad GPT, you'll, you'll get an automatic F and possibly, you know, expelled from <laughs> school, which is kind of crazy to me. That's their solution to that problem. But, but I think all of that is going to incorporate in the metaverse. So you're going to have environments where AI, you know, when you interact with something in the metaverse, you're not going to know if that is a human or if it's a, you know, CPU within right. the gaming system or just those worlds of assistance. And, and that to me is so exciting because, you know, from a budgeting perspective, imagine like, you know, these algorithms being put into a metaverse where you walk into a financial institution or you sit down with somebody in the virtual world and you type in, please look at all of my financial data, what I buy, when I buy it. And then it spits you back in eight seconds, you know, essentially telling you you're way out of your budget. Here's what you need to start doing. Here are all the things that you're buying that you shouldn't be buying, you know, and, it, and that, that, that can happen. And that's what I think is so right. cool with that tech. And, and then I think you have the other conceptual stuff that's pretty amazing where, you can go visit certain countries and things and not actually be there. Yeah. You know, that's kind of, I think, the, the, the cool part of it, I guess, down the road. But right now, it's the tech that's starting to align with it that I think is going to be change, like world changing yeah. and advance our civilization forward. So you said something in there. There's two things I, I want to, the first one is I want to dig into this money side of things because I was reading this New Yorker article about the metaverse and they said, you know, meta life, you know, whatever you want to call it, will probably involve a reimagination of financial life and possibly a shift in our existing social hierarchies and institutions. And I think that's what you're getting at. I tend to be more techno utopian like you are, I think, like I get excited about these technologies, but my yeah. first thought when you said, here's how it could help you to help your financial wellness is 
but it could also go the other way. And you think about yeah. our young kids going in there and suddenly they're convinced that something like buy now, pay later is a good thing. And uh, yeah. I, I haven't found a reason why that would actually be true. But and that's just one example. But when AI gets involved on the finance side, and this is the case with any technology, right? So yeah. there's, there's going to be a negative side and there's going to be a positive side. And I'm, I'm curious to know if you have any thoughts on what needs to happen in order for it to, in order for us to take advantage of the, the positives, you know, knowing that the negatives are always going to be lurking there. Cause I, I like your idea, which is that, you know, look at my finances and, you know, help me um, be yeah. a you know better saver or whatever it might be. So I'd, I'd like your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, you know, the first part of it is I, I think having that, ability within the tech to adapt and cope. So, you know, one of the things you see right now with, you know, chat GPT and those things is you see pushback of like, what you know, people are not trying to adapt to it and cope with it. They're trying to say, nope, you can't use it, right? right? Which we know how that, and so, but I think the same from yeah. the financial institution side, we have to start participating in these conversations and not moving fast to say no. Like I know, I think Chase just said there are, they can't use it. A lot of the investment companies are saying, you know, don't, you can't use it. Um, and so I think that's where we've got to start participating from financial institutions and looking at this and going from a perspective of a design thinking approach of what problem are we trying to solve? Are we trying to solve a problem of like, like you mentioned of that these environments now are making it really easy to buy things. Like you can just double click, yeah. scan your face and automatically purchase something. And even like buy now, pay later, it seems like this, another vicious cycle of getting something material early because you don't want to wait and save for it. And so I think part of it is, is that the financial institutions need to start looking at these things differently than they look at it now, like doing understanding your credit seminars, budgeting. So like you have to evolve of like, budgeting from the digital environment and you know that the amount of in-app purchases that kids buy you know i think what candy crush is four hundred thousand dollars a day that people buy wow. in-app purchases with <laughs> you know and then not to mention you look at the phones themselves you know i i wow. mean it is really fascinating the devices the costs of them if you you know the the phone companies and the tech companies have got so smart with the phones of like oh it's only forty dollars a month but have you ever said, like, click the button, buy now, like, don't yeah. pay the monthly payments? I mean, it's like $1,800 for an iPhone. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And if the 13-year-old, <laughs> 10-year-old kid has that, yeah. that expensive device in their hand, it's, you know, um, and schools require them now. Like, they require yeah. iPads and they require these things. And so that's where I think you're going to see this shift of challenges because, you know, the more we are, that evolves, the more expensive it's going to get. You know, I, it's interesting because, you know, you mentioned that your kid's school said, if you use chat G GPT, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be yeah. penalized. But it doesn't it feel like when you get those kind of mandates, a little bit like the music industry and Napster, like so yeah. desperate to figure out how to deal with it. And I just read an article yesterday about chat GPT and uh, Bing AI. I have not used Bing, but it's, gonna, yeah. you know, it's having a moment too. And how to use it as an adjunct to your writing, you know, how to use yeah. it in, in a beneficiary way to help to help you improve your own work. Yeah. And we're talking about here with regard to finance, we're talking also, you know, a, a lot of this has to run through big institutions, which are you know, generally fairly conservative. So they're not going to, there's not going to yeah. be an immediate uptake. Hey, let's get on the crypto bandwagon. In fact, yeah. it's the opposite. And so how should institutions think about this and how can they take advantage, especially if they're fairly conservative, is there a way that they can kind of dip their toes into the metaverse or into crypto in a way that's going to position them to be able to compete in five to 10 years? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think what we educate, we, we have a gentleman that he sits on the blockchain coalition for the state of Utah. And him and I have lots of conversations about all of this. And really what we we are preaching is staying curious right now, being a part of the conversation, 
mm. being a part of like your local government and seeing how are they doing? What are they, how are they researching it? And then just talk to the users, you know, seeing what are some of the problems yeah. they're having, the why, and really immersing in that. And I think that will prepare you for the future of when you have to start. You know, that's kind of the way to dip your toes in it of researching, following, yeah. And then maybe even having some, you know, R and D to test some stuff out. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I know within our company, we test things all the time and, you know, and if it doesn't work, you kind of go with that fail fast, right. And, and move on to the <laughs> next. But, yeah. but I think it's one of those things you, it can't be these things, you know, a, a lot of the, I think with a lot of banking and, and banking products and services. The challenge is that you do have that conservative approach and you do have individuals that make policies and procedures based on the lowest common denominator. And I think in these environments, you can't do that. It's like with yeah. remote deposit capture. I mean, I remember, I mean, there's still institutions this day that you have to wait a month to, you know, do your first, first remote deposit capture to see if you're a fraudster or so they make these rules, but they want adoption. So, but, you know, try and figure out different ways to get adoption instead of like saying, okay, most people do their fraud in this amount of time. So let's not yeah. do this, like build in that factor. And so that's right. I think with this stuff is it's, you've got to have individuals that are testing this out, trying things, um, bringing new ideas to the table that the, that the, the leadership team is listening to and not saying, no, 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 that's not us. I, I think there's, you know, nothing wrong with bringing in guest speakers or, developing a strategy around it of what what will we do if crypto takes off or if chat gpt does take off and we have you know like one of the things that i mean we'll talk about the scary side of it yep. is there's actually meta is working with whatsapp they're one of their part of their company to develop ai user personas where if you chat to me and say hey brett what are you doing today it's going to use all of my past conversations in my calendar and all that and say, oh, I'm actually in a meeting from 10 to one, John, let's, let's meet up later today for a beer at this local place. Cause it knows on Wednesdays, I have nothing planned and you won't know if it's me or if it's my chat bot, you know? So, and I, and that's coming. And I think that that's where it's the scary side is that do we, do we want to go down a path that makes, makes social interactions like our kids and things like watching how much they they're not interacting with each other. Like it feels like everything right now is very like transfer me money via Venmo. Yeah. I'll chat with my friends via chat. Like there's no, there's not a lot of face to face anymore. Yeah. It's, it's very, yeah. you know, fascinating to me, but I, but I think that financial institutions in general need to start set aside R and D set aside a team that's doing these conversations, watching, bringing it to the leadership team on a bi-weekly basis of what's happening because it is moving so fast. Yeah. Yeah. And when I say institutionally, say, you know, if I belong to a credit union, I certainly want them to be conservative on some level. I don't want them to be yes. playing oh, fast yeah. and loose with my money. So I understand <laughs> right. if I'm running a credit union, this is a very, very hard space to kind of find a place to plant your flag. I, I, I want to make that very clear. Yeah. Cause I understand this is very difficult and, but I, I do what I think, what I see the reactions that, that happen. And I'm actually not talking on the, on the financial institution level. I, I think the reaction of teachers saying no G chat GPT, that reminds me of when I was in high school uh, and I, I was doing a paper on my computer and my teacher would not accept my paper on a dot matrix printer. And I thought, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I've just used a word processor to write this paper and now I have to go back to a typewriter and type it out. And it's those kind of things that make you as a student think, okay, these guys just do not get it. And it just doesn't make any sense. And if this is, I mean, ChatGTP is a whole, you know, another level beyond, you know, switching yeah. from going to a dot matrix printer to a typewriter. But it's that same kind of reactionary approach that that, you know, ended up killing the music industry where you just say, no, we're going to yeah. we're going to try to we're going to try to police our way out of this. And, you know, you're not going to police your way out of something where the youth is involved because they're going to figure out some way to make to, to use oh, this yeah. technology. You've got to figure out how to embrace it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, it was funny. I attended a, a career fair yesterday. 
uh, not career fair, a career day at my daughter's high school. And I yeah. got to speak to the students and, and then be in the kind of like gym and talk about some of this stuff. And it is amazing. They find ways like, you know, in my conversation was app development with the kids. And one of them said, like, what do I think of Life360, which is that app that can show you where your kids are at, how fast they're driving. And I go and they asked me, what do you think of that? And I go, well, I think every kid knows a way a hack around that. And they all like <laughs> smiled, like no one didn't smile. And it's like, oh, I know the hack. You just go into the data plan and you turn off the data and it's going to pinpoint yep. where you were at originally. It's not going to say you turned yep. your phone off. But I think, you know, the other thing, I forgot to mention this piece. The one area I do think we can impact as financial institutions in the metaverse right now is financial education for kids. I would say like 60 to 70% of their time, there's tons of articles about roadblocks, Minecraft, all these games these kids are in, The Sims, Grand Theft Auto, like, and that's, a, Grand Theft Auto is an extreme, but, but these games have no financial, like in Roadblox, you, you can go to Bloxburg, build houses, get a job, and when you walk out of your job, it just pops up with a blank and says you made 300 bucks, right? Mm. But if we built in there like a credit union where they can learn to be a teller, they can deposit their check after, they can see like, because they're having to pay bills in the game. Mm -hmm. Why not have some form of education in that game? Go where the kids are at. I think sometimes these things are missed, you know, because it's like marketing, right? I mean, you you market where the people are at. You know, you don't. And that's where I think we're missing the boat a little bit. I, I think that we could partner with some of these companies, whether it's our credit union leagues, you know, CUNA, the National Credit Union Foundation. Like, I, I think these organizations need to start talking to some of these gaming companies and say, hey, can we partner and put a credit union in the game or, you know? have some form of education. You know, that's a great idea because a lot of these credit union foundations will run financial simulations, you know, things like an yes. amount about money and the idea of doing, I don't know, I know that some of them have kind of apps that are tied to it, but the idea of doing it in virtual space makes so much sense because, yeah. you know, if, if, you've, if, if you've ever done, I've done one of those financial simulations and they really are eye-opening. They can be really help. I did it as an adult because I was kind of testing yeah. it out. But when kids do them, they always learn something from them. So I think you're onto that. I think that's a, that's a fantastic idea. Well, and then you get the influencers. So like one, one of the things that most fascinated me was this was a couple weeks ago. My younger daughter follows It's Funny is like this influencer and her mm -hmm. and her friends, they sit and play Minecraft or roadblocks and talk, but there's millions of followers that just watch all day. They watch these. So they did a fundraiser. So it was an hour fundraiser and they had a QR code on the screen. So this is in YouTube and they were doing it for, I forgot the children's hospital that they were doing it mm. for, but if you donated money, scan the code and donated money, they would make a pizza in the game and then share your name. So they would say your name. And I, yep. I actually recorded it. So my daughter, I was like, hey, donate 25 bucks. Let's see what happens. And they yep. made her a pepperoni pizza. And then they said, thank you very much, Grace. You know, and they read Grace's message. And the look on her face was like, but here's the thing. In an hour, they almost hit $2 million, which I'm like, I've attended credit unit events where, I mean, we sit there and paddle raise and do all, and we don't even hit close to that. And these no, kids, that's like influencers. And, yeah. And it's like, so that's, it's one of those things where it's like, how do you, the only way you can be a part of this stuff is to research it, watch it, understand it, participate in it. And I think that that's where if, I mean, if I, if someone came to, to like our company and said, Hey, Brett, we really want to get in the metaverse. How would we do it? This is exactly, I mean, this was the first part is financial education is the, the best entry point because you already have a huge generation that's in it. Yeah. And I, you know, I love this because I mean, now you're talking about the, uh, the share jar and making that, is it possible yeah. for you to share that video? Can we share that in the show notes? Because mm -hmm. I would love if you're, if you're okay with it, I think people oh, yeah, would yeah. love to see $2 million. That's incredible. <laughs> Obviously, I'm excited about the fact that that you're excited about financial education being a real opportunity in the metaverse. And I've we've already got plenty of really cool ideas of thinking about. I have to ask you this question though, and this is a little bit off subject. What are your feelings on you know TikTok being owned by Tencent? So I have to send you the notes that I've got on this, but 
Yeah. I know that they, I believe they own a percentage of Fortnite. They also yeah. own Spotify. So you see like these virtual concerts. I mean, think of this, like Tencent is doing virtual concerts in Fortnite and they already have the artists because they own Spotify. So it, yeah. I think that it's one of those things. It is scary. I will say that, it, you know, these companies like even Apple and Google, the amount of power that they have on just all of us, I think it is scary. But at the same time, I think we're going to see more of this happen. And then even with Tencent, they own, I think they own WeChat. And that's mm -hmm. a payment platform too. So, I mean, they, yeah, there's a yeah. lot of things that they can do and TikTok, which is, I think my kids spend more screen time on TikTok than <laughs> any other app. So, you know, and I, I'm not on TikTok, but I do know, you know, TikTok has, I mean, my wife has cooked a number of meals based on TikTok recipes. I know my kids, I know a big thing on TikTok was because I have one who's one kid who's in college, another one who is applying right now. And there is a lot of content on there about avoiding college debt. So that is a yeah. major positive. And I think that's great. Yeah. Because it's something we obviously talk about here at home. But the fact that it's making the rounds on TikTok, I think that that gave me a little hope. I was excited about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think it's anything, you know, you, there is like the positives and negatives to everything. You know, I think yeah. that, yeah, because now the big movement is someone, I have a friend, he sent me an app now that it controls your screen time. And mm -hmm. I know like that, you know, Google and Apple have their screen time, but this one, you pay a hundred dollars a year and it legit, well, you get like points and bonuses for not spending too much time on social and like, it's really a fascinating, I'll put this in the, I'll send you this link too as well. Good, um, good, good. Because I've been, I've been playing with it and it is really fascinating where it, it kind of like penalizes you if you, like if you get up in the middle of the night and look at your phone, right? We, yep. we, they've been done studies that that blue light can affect your sleeping patterns sure. and stuff. Well, it'll penalize yep. you. You won't get your little sleep token. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, the phones definitely have, you know, I, I think a lot of it has come from the uh, Tristan Harris's company. I'm forgetting the name of it. Maybe we can put it into the, the show notes, but of, of making tech much more focused on our own wellness. There are a lot of now built in mechanisms to help you protect yourself. Yes. Against yeah. The, uh, against using the phone too much. So we both, I have want to ask you this. We both do a lot of work with credit unions, for example. Where do you think Credit unions' biggest opportunities lie when it comes to metaverse tech, maybe even family financial wellness. Well, first the financial wellness for kids. I think that's kind of the starting point. Yep. Just because, you know, that's where they're all the kids are at. But then I think you can piggyback a lot of that stuff with the parents. I mm -hmm. think opportunity of educating parents, like what games are your kids in and how much money are they spending? So if mm -hmm. we create certain algorithms within mobile and online banking that say, hey, your kid, like, I mean, my kids have checking accounts at a credit union and there's, you can go in and look kind of what they're spending and how they're spending it, but more data on that, controlling more of that, educating them on that. I think there's a lot of opportunity yeah. there. I think, the, yeah. you know, the other opportunity is, is with student loan debt, college, you know, college selection, buying their first car, like, I, I just feel like there needs to be some form of digital platform that helps walk parents through these life journeys. And the ones that I've been a part of, it's like you go to this college night, they tell you all these things that your kids need to be prepared for, how they select their college. And then the lovely, the end of it, they bring out the individual that talks to you about you know, financial aid and shows you the true cost of college. And you're just like, where's my, where's my paper bag? And so I, I do think there is a form of, like looking at, looking at a credit union, looking at your members and defining what are some of the problems within yeah. those environments, yeah. whether it's, you know, like find out pay later, if it's, you know, the payday lenders, or if it's, Hey, you're, you've got kids and what does that cycle look like? And what are some, you know, and, and not making it overcomplicated, but I really think yeah. these are op living in life events with individuals. I think we need to get back to that as, as credit unions. I think we do it yeah. with our communities. We do really a great job with our communities. But I think looking at the life events of individuals and tying things around that education, services, apps, digital things, you know, to help people through these, these life cycles. Got it. 
So tell me how you have, I mean, you mentioned the video, your kids were raising ridiculous amounts of money via influencer. Yeah. What's another way that you're using tech to teach your own kids about money, to help them? You know, how are you embracing tech to do that? Gosh, a lot of things that I'm, I've really gotten into now is, um, so there's the, we bought a 3D printer. So our kind of big Christmas item, we bought a 3D printer for the family. And so one of the things that, you know, I'm showing my kids, like how individuals out there are utilizing 3D printers to print things and sell things on the internet. So there's, you know, mm -hmm. Etsy. And so I'm teaching them kind of from a business perspective because they're babysitting now. And so kind of talking about that from a business lens of like, how do you approach that conversation with an adult when you need to babysit their kids? What do you charge? Yeah. Why do you charge that amount? What makes you different from other babysitters? And so we're utilizing, you know, some of these resources like websites, Instagram pages, and things to, to promote themselves to get, get kind of a cash flow. Yep. So we've got the 3D printer. And then we also talk about other ideas. So my younger daughter is she does coding for roadblocks. And so when that she publishes a game or a piece of clothing or something like that, Roadblocks pays her a, pays back in road bucks so she can buy yeah. things in the game. So we talk yeah. about kind of that piece of it of like, okay, so you spent eight hours developing this game for roadblocks and they gave you two bucks in road bucks. Is that worth your time <laughs> and why, you know? So there are right. kind of like life lessons that you can teach with tech coding. And then the other piece too is, is you know, the value, I, I think one of my favorite things is to watch kids with their devices. Like at the high school yesterday, they treat them so poorly. Like I watched, like we were in this gym and I could have literally heard like 50 phones drop, right? In that wood floor. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, these are like $1,800, $1,600 phones, right? And you just see like, they kind of throw their laptops around. I, I look at it like, wow, this is an expensive piece of, you know, tech. Of course, all that financial apps. So we, our kids are enrolled in, you know, a credit union. They have checking accounts. They both have mobile apps on their phone. They transfer funds from their savings. We teach them about, you know, kind of that, uh, our, our daughter really got into buying all of her friends food. And we're like, hey, you worked all summer long. You can't buy your friends mm -hmm. you know, dinner every time. You know, you got to, mm -hmm. you know, teach the going Dutch, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, yep. But yeah. Now, you, so they have a checking account. Have they written a check? <laughs> no, no, no. Venmo, <laughs> Venmo is their life. Right. And then we also right. do kind of that Apple yep. to transfer money. But no, they, they don't. In fact, it was funny in a class that I was talking to, I asked them a question of like, what do you, what do you call like, when you make money and, and where do you put it and how do you do it? A lot of them say, call it money management. It's how I manage my money. Mm -hmm. Like none of them yeah. say checking account. They're all like, well, it's, you know, I have it in my app where I manage my money. Like it's really yeah. fascinating that it's going to be fun in the next two to three years with how things yeah. pivot. It definitely will. I, I have to tell you, yeah. Speaking of not treating your technology devices well, we caught our older daughter one time dragging her phone by the cord as though it were a dog on a leash. <laughs> and <laughs> just what is going on? Okay. Yeah. So we only have a limited amount of time. I, I, I still have a lot of questions I would like to ask about technology, but I have to ask you our fast and fun round questions because okay. I love getting the answers to these. So are you prepared That's for these, cool. Brett? I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. You're strapped in. You're ready. Here we go. First one is, what does the term money empowered mean to you? Money empowered. It, me it means that you can make, well, you can make decisions, gosh, decisions based on being financially, making strong financial decisions. I would say that is yep. your money empowered, that you, the things you buy, the things you do, you have the financial empowerment to do so. Great. Thank you. What is the best investment of time or money you've ever spent on your kids? Ooh, on my kids. I would say our vacations on preferably Disney cruises. It's very expensive to bring kids on those Disney cruises, but I'm telling you, it's like, it's, we always talk about it. 
Yeah. Experiences. Experiences are key. That's great. Yeah. What advice to your kids do you most hope that they will listen to? I would say the life experiences, that material things are material things, but life experiences, well, they define you. And that's one of the, you know, especially I would say my daughter going to a private school, a lot of the kids drive like really expensive cars. And it's, yeah. it's great to know that she drives kind of a, it's a good car, but it's definitely not an Audi or a BMW, but she doesn't bother for it all. Like she never brings it up. And I just think that's cool. It's She's more involved in the life experiences of like where we're going, the beach, you know, those type of things. Nice. Very nice. If you could transmit a message that everyone would see, sky written, it's going to be on a billboard, it's going to be all over the place. What would that message say, Brett? Oh, I would honestly say like, is, is now the age I am, live every day at a time, take a day at a time and enjoy the day, enjoy the day. Cause it goes so fast. It's just unbelievable. That seems very appropriate for you. You always seem very present to every conversation that I've ever been in with you. <laughs> yeah. It's just enjoying the cause things. It's just amazing. Like, especially last year, we had a lot of life events happen and, you know, it just making sure that you get the most out of all of it. Yeah. Good advice. Okay. What's the one parenting and or money smarts book podcast? It could be any media. It could be a game that you go back to, or that you give the most often. Everybody lies. That is my favorite by far. The book is essentially about the gentleman. Part of his research is he looks at Google searches and people wow. don't lie to yeah. Google. That's what he, <laughs> that's the point he's trying to prove. So yeah. Yeah. Everybody lies. That's the name of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we will put that in the show notes too. Okay, Brett. So how can people find you on social media and or the web to the extent that you want them to find you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've got, so Instagram, it's just Brett Wooden, but if you really want to have fun and follow my Lego stuff. So in college and in high school, which is kind of interesting in high school is, is Woody, the woodpecker was my, so Woody was my nickname because my last name is Wooden. And then as I got into college, Woody from Toy Story is where everybody kind of associated me with, but I have Lego Woody and that's where all of my Lego builds and I was on Instagram. So if you're interested in seeing kind of the Lego side of me and then LinkedIn, I like LinkedIn is the hub for me yeah. as well as Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Now the audience may not know this. They probably can't tell, but Brett is six, four and played, you played college football, right? Yeah. I played a year. So yeah, and then realize like, <laughs> I'm not fast enough, not, you know. But you were defensive end, school, weren't you? Too. Yeah, so they moved me in high school as a defensive end. And then in college, when I went to the all-star game, they moved me to defensive back. And yeah, that's okay. kind of where trying to le relearn something was not, not, yeah. not fun. Yeah, so. well, yeah, that, <laughs> well, that's like the prototypical, that, those are the kind of defensive backs that teams want now. Six, four long arms, like right, the Seahawks yeah. just got Tariq Woolen and you know, not to get too off on the tangent here, but uh, we're excited about that up in, uh, yeah. in Seattle Seahawks country. <laughs> so the funny thing, I'll, you know, I'll kind of end with this was that you mentioned the Seahawks. So yesterday at the career day, so Shane Waldron is the offensive coordinator for the Seattle Seahawks. He went to oh, La yeah. the LaSalle where I was at. And he yep. spoke via Zoom to the kids. My daughter was the only female in his session talking about his career. So I thought it was really, <laughs> all the teachers were coming up to me and like, she's breaking the ceiling. She's, she wants to get into sports <laughs> coaching. And I was like, all right, you know, so it's pretty cool. But That's fantastic. He's a cool guy too. Oh, Shane is? Yeah, yeah. He, I played neat. football with him in high school. He was a year older. So nice, nice. Okay, well, one last question, which is what's one action you'd like other people to take that would be helpful for you? I would say, you know, if, if financial institutions are listening right now, it's really start the conversation of that financial education. And if you are interested in moving that stuff forward, I mean, reach out to me in those social environments and I can help with that conversation and get, just get things started. You know, I, I think that that's a big thing for kids right now is, is helping them in those environments. 
Well, this has been fantastic, Brett. I am so glad you came on and we had a kind of different type of conversation talking about the metaverse and tech. I think we only tapped into a tiny amount of the information that you are able to share, but I'm glad you were able to at least get some of that in in, on here on the Art of Allowance podcast. So thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me.